Well, thank you very much, all three of you, for these intriguing, very interesting presentations. Um, I would like to first sort of bring together the different perspectives, or let's say frame the different perspectives, because um, I think the perspective of the Leo Beck Institute and um, of the University Library are sort of um, a sim familiar or connected, whereas um, the historical and political circumstances under which the virtual Stittel portal is operating are uh, pretty much different. And of course, this has to do um, with um, the aftermath of, of the Second World War and the extension of, of mass destruction of Jewish cultural heritage that took place. And, um, and the aim of virtual Stittel to a sort of like raise awareness and, and consciousness of, of Jewish life takes place from another starting point than um, the, the distribution of Jewish cultural heritage online that the two institutions you, you presenting uh, are promoting. So I'm wondering, I would like to start talking about sort of ethical consideration, um, why, why um, you are doing, or we are doing, what we are doing. Um, Chaim Gärtner always emphasizes that um, he feels he has the moral obligation to, to open um, access to the archives of Yad Vashem in order to commemorate um, the, the life of those who died. So I'm wondering, um, what are the basic ethical considerations that are motivating um, your, your approaches or your um, access to either what you have or what you're gathering online? Should I begin? Yeah. Um, one has to recall that the Leo Beck Institute was founded by, one could say, the elite of German Jewry who managed to survive and, uh, and emigrate to flee. And they took it upon themselves as an ethical imperative to collect the heritage of German and German-speaking Jewry for their own descendants. I don't think that the founders of the Leo Beck Institute really had the non-Jewish public in mind. They did insofar as the main goal of the founders of the institution was to write a history of German Jewry, which they thought would be completed within 10 years, and that the institute could then cease to exist. They weren't really got great plans to start amassing a, a large library or archive. Um, and then over the decades, as interest, of course, in German Jewish history increased, and it increased also on the side of non-Jewish German historians already during the 1960s, then there was definitely, I'm not so sure I would call it an ethical imperative, but certainly the necessity to make the materials that the Leo Beck Institute had acquired up until that point in time available. And this led in different stages, finally, to the establishment of the branch of the Leo Beck Institute at the Jewish Museum Berlin, which was really erected in order to facilitate the massive amount of research that was being done on German-Jewish and German-Jewish-speaking history um, throughout Europe and in Israel, the United States and Canada, and all of those scholars were having to travel to New York in order to access the materials. Now, in the digital age, we've gone, a, we've made a giant leap forward because through the digitization of these materials, everything is available to the widest possible audience, and the use of the materials has expanded so exponentially. We now have high school students in Germany who are writing papers in grade 10 on topics of German Jewish history using primary source material. That was a bit unthinkable um, uh, 15 years ago. Yes, so maybe I can say because I'm the opposite. I mean, not the opposite um, in the idea, but the opposite of the starting point. The um, Frankfurt University's library collection, the Judaica collection, and the Hebraica collection from before the war was given mainly by uh, Frankfurt Jews or was bought with the money of by, from mostly Frankfurt Jews in order to bring the Jewish culture into the city community, to the city of Frankfurt and to the 
um, Bürger, as I say, the Bürgergesellschaft, the Citoyen of Frankfurt, and their main uh, interest was to make the Jewish culture known in the Germans in the 19th century in the hope also of um, then reducing anti-Semitic tendencies and anti-Semitism of the 19th century. So there were, of course, Jewish libraries in Frankfurt, but this rich collection and very precious was given to the then city and to their university library. So from the beginning, the aim was to make it public. And um, we are speaking about mostly printed uh, material. Uh, with, so um, it's known, it was collected. And after the Second World War, and the, luckily not so much, many destructions in this collection, uh, this collection served as the basis for, as I said, the special collection for literature on Judaism and um, Israel. It's financed by public money, by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft mostly, and by the university. And so I think that um, the reason for its existence is really to be used by everybody, and especially by the non-Jewish uh, majority of Germany and uh, all over the world today with the techniques. And um, I think that this collection and also shows um, how much German Jews were a part of Germany. That I think what I have met when I started working in the library many years ago, that for many Germans then, it was still the word, to take the word Jew into the mouth was a problem, and they were trying to transcribe it by all kinds of words. Um, and on the one hand, but on the other hand, many of them had connection to Jewish past. Many people have Jewish grandmothers um, or have some connections or knew that their grandparents had Jewish neighbors. So um, I think this collection is an opportunity to make uh, the knowledge more founded and to give all the, um, the efforts of the last years that have been growing to know the own history of Germany, not only of Germany, but the Jewish culture here, um, to give it the details, to give it the specifics. Um, and so uh, this is um, the main task, and there are no reservations about this. And of course today, because of techniques, we are used um, from all over the world. And it, it, um, it shows that a lot of German Jewish culture or of Jewish culture in Germany, also from people who immigrated from East Europe, uh, has still remained in Germany. That means that also Jews or Jewry in Germany was totally destroyed by the Nazis. They were our remnants. You have to dig them out, you have to go to libraries, you have to look for the collections, but they're still there, so you can bring back the roots of the past. Uh, is it on? Yes. Um, the case of virtual shadow is slightly different because it's more collecting information, and uh, so it's more intellectual property. And uh, the main goal of the portal is to make the information as widely available as possible. And as you've seen on from this, this um, virtual shuttle statistics, there are, uh, there are users from all over the world, from Israel and from the United States, descendants of Polish Jews uh, who are looking for the, for, for information on the places their families came from and uh, they don't have to travel to Poland anymore. I mean, they sometimes do too, but they, before they do, they have, they are provided with um, very comprehensive and detailed information on, on the places and on, uh, on the history, on, 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 on Jewish history of, of a given place. And uh, I think it's extremely important and uh, and uh, mm, and I also think the the policy of the Pauline Museum um, mm, uh, is to also with the Central Judaica database is to make the the mm, collect the collection of Jewish artifacts also available um, online for the uh, the widest possible public and 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 uh, i think it's it because of the growing interest in jewish history and jewish culture in poland after 1989 uh, i think that the, the mm, 
aside from the obvious, the descendants of Polish Jews from all over the world who are, who are searching, who are seeking information on, on the places that they, 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 they have roots, roots in, and there is a, an enormous interest in Polish Jewish culture and history and heritage amongst Poles. And, and uh, this is also sort of addressed to, to the non-Jews who, um, who uh, have also an unlimited access to, to information on various aspects of, of Jewish culture and history. Well, I'd like to open the discussion already if there is questions. I have a lot of more questions to discuss over here, but I don't want to, you know, I want to open access to you too. So if there is questions, you may join in. Otherwise, I keep on. <laughs> There's a question. Ah, oh, there is one. There is one? No. Okay. Um, well, we already, like, um, from the, the sort of ethical consideration, we were already speak, speaking about target groups, um, which, which would be my, my, my next interest. Um, um, because it seems to me like virtual Städtel is a sort of connected um, to the, let's say, um, maybe it's too strong to say Jewish renewal, but there is a sort of a, a raising awareness of Jewish roots of a lot of Poles today, and there is some, some are coming back, um, some discover their roots and so on, and Jewish, and I think virtual Städtel contributes to that. And, but on the other end, there is, I think, a strong target group um, of um, like Jews all over the world who have a sort of Polish Jewish roots, and it offers information to them. So um, um, I was a bit surprised how much you are now like revising the user-generated content that once was on display, because I always thought um, that in, within this context of, of like raising awareness and like bringing people in, it was a very nice gesture that you could like contribute and um, and um, well well um, publish whatever you know. Um, so so I'm I'm wondering um, um, did this have an effect on your users that they know now that everything is being revised or are they still contributing the same way? And I'm wondering for the two of you, um, your institutions, um, what, what and the target groups we already spoke about, like um, our um, scholarly to school, um, do you get a lot of like direct feedback sort of questions are, are like informations being corrected or questions what do you do with this sort of feedback do you do you open the discussion or, or do you what, what do you do with it maybe I'd start with virtual shuttle uh, the we I don't think it has a, a direct impact on on the way uh, on the on our on on the users and or on people who still contribute a lot of information to the virtual shtetl. What is being verified uh, at the moment is mostly the history of Jewish community section, which is a, a historical. It's it. These are texts. Sometimes at the, at the beginning of the portal's existence, there were texts sent in by, posted by by. Uh, Various people which, which were not always uh, historically true. There were some either points missing or some uh, uh, facts were not exactly historically true. So what we do now is we verify, a team, team of historians is verifying those texts. But these are mostly the, 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 mm, the section the, mm, the historical section. There are still um, there is a section on uh, witness accounts and and 
and relation uh, and 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 uh, accounts of um, former residents of various places who are still alive and uh, information on on what's happening in given places at the moment uh, in relation to Jewish subjects and that's still I mean that that's the information that is still flowing and and, and is is uh, I think there's no I we have noticed that uh, the users have sort of turned their backs on us because we're verifying the information they provide obviously we're in a bit of a different situation um, there's not a lot of correction to be done on primary sources um, so sometimes our users are notifying us that a uh, Hebrew manuscript has appeared on it upside down, um, which happens also even at the Leo Beck Institute that you'll find Hebrew, uh, Hebrew sources then um, digitized and then put online in the, in the wrong fashion. There's a, very good, there's a very good communication between the users of the LBI and, and the Institute. Uh, I know that one of your questions was talking about social media, so there's a lot of interaction on social media and there's a lot of new things that are published both directly pertaining to holdings at the Leo Beck Institute on Facebook and other social media by the Leo Beck Institute, but also other things. So you've got that kind of interaction. It's interesting because the target group in many respects for the Leo Beck Institute is similar to that of the, of the university library, simply because the majority of people working on German Jewish history are non-Jewish Germans and Austrians. It has been that way for, for three decades now. And the Leo Beck Institute, from its beginning, although it was an institute that was established for the descendants of German Jewry and German-speaking Jewry, has always emphasized the fact that the Jewish history is inextractable from German history. And that's true of all nation, national histories, particularly true of, of Poland. So, um, so that the, the targeted use, and the other interesting thing, of course, about the about the evolution of the Leo Beck Institute and its target group and users is, is that the descendants of the founders and of the overwhelming majority of the donors of the materials, which are in their overwhelming majority in the German language, don't speak or read German anymore. The descendants of the donors of the material themselves. So they know that it's being preserved, but their accessibility to it through language isn't there. So the Leo Beck Institute is very interesting because they've also been translating certain primary sources for descendants as well. Yes, I think we also, most people use the, uh, the sites and the websites and then they don't react. We get, I get uh, emails uh, of people who want to add things, who are wondering why this or that is missing. Somebody in Australia needs a book and um, he wants to have it added immediately on the uh, website. Um, and when we moved also the compact memory from the old platform to the new platform, then people reacted but, and said, you know, why did you move or now it's better or it's worse. But um, uh, this is a sign for me that things are working and people only write, write to us when uh, something, um, they need of something. And of course, if somebody wants to publish a part of the um, sources, then they need a better quality, they need TIFFs, and then of course we get into contact. Um, um, that's what I say, it's always the sad side of the digitization projects. You ha don't have any contact anymore with your users. You just have uh, numbers, statistics. Um, uh, but on the other hand, that's a success uh, of the digital portals. Well, wonderful. There is a question. <laughs> uh, do you get the, the microphone or you want to have mine? Hello. Um, I have also a question to the uh, Städtel. Um, I was wondering, uh, yesterday I was in the Natural History Museum and there was the presentation of the Tate Gallery uh, map. And now when I, when I saw the, the websites you um, showed us, um, I thought if the information there is all, uh, also open, 
that some apps would be created for people who come to Poland and who want to see the sites. So are you, are you already working on that? Are you asking about applications? Yes. yes. Um, like applications for the, the smartphone to, to travel right. in Poland to see the sites which you have um, presented on the website. I think there are plans to work on this, but as far as I know, it's not happening as yet. But there are plans of the, uh, the uh, from the very beginning of the virtual shuttle portal, there was a plan of creating a kind of a, a GPS map of all the all the localities that are profiled on virtual shtetl and i'm sure it'll happen but it's it's not yet i'm, I'm I, I hope it'll happen soon it's it's in the it's there is a, a project to to do that okay thank you well is there any other questions like a last one when hello my name is Barbara Fischer. I'm speaking here for Wikimedia Deutschland. And uh, I would just like to add a question to my former speaker and maybe um, ask the, uh, both from, from the person from the Leo Back Institute and uh, uh, Frau Heuberger from Frankfurt and uh, the, I don't get the name now from Poland. Um, but um, the, the point is, if you do everything yourself, um, it might be very hard, but you could engage uh, with the community, like the people out there, they are not just only interested in reading and, and uh, doing research, but maybe there are coders that could develop that application for you in case you would provide the, the, the data in an open way so they could easily access to it and develop new um, applications and um, as I understood the uh, um, you're from the Leo Back Institute you have already started to shape that access and go in, into the community be part of the community by editing article on on the English uh, Wikipedia and I would like to know what what is your experience in in that community field and and how does it um, correspond with with the the other work you're you're doing. So, I, I'd like to to find out like how how is your future vision of interacting, being like part of the community and not just providing, but being in a dialogue with with the community. Thanks. I mean, at the at the moment, as far as I can see from Berlin, it's being actually undertaken by my colleagues in New York. Um, so there's an awful lot of interaction on the social media. And you're absolutely right. Of course, there are all kinds of, of, of unimagined possibilities of how users can contribute, um, not so much to the further building up of the archives, but to the use of the material in, in different ways. And I think that's, that's something which the future holds in stores. And uh, the Institute is, of course, because it's also, you have to remember, it's embedded in an institution where there are four other partner institutions. So it's, it certainly is an environment of, of sharing and cooperation and collaboration. And I think it, you're, you're right, it's very important that, that one opens that up also to the community, um, the, the, the community that one doesn't see every day when one walks through the door of the Institute itself. Yes, I think I would add this, I would um, say the same thing. Um, we are part of a library, so we have some restrictions. And um, I think our next step will now be to open what we call a virtual research environment that we will create, we'll try to create a platform where people can respond. I mean, also we are now on Facebook and so, but we have to try and find a way to institute this, to make it, you know, in an instituted way. I mean, people can now use all the content. It's free, it's open, you can download it, you can connect by OIE. But uh, what we want to do is now to open the platform where we can um, learn about these reactions and work together. And this will be the next step, uh, certainly. And I think we've already kind of done this because the virtual shuttle is based, it's, it's the, the uh, the portal work is based on the web 2.0 technology, which is similar to Wikipedia. So it sort of already created a platform of, of uh, uh, working with the with, with the, the users, external users, and creating a community of 
of users uh, who contribute to the, who use the information, also contribute to the portal. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much for listening, and um, thank you for the, for the speakers. And I would like to end this panel. Thank you.